We, the Center for Global Development, we're a group that try and see how we can make the international system that supports global development work more effectively. How do we finance infrastructure in the poorest parts of the world? How do we increase productivity in agriculture? What kind of policy brings out the best outcomes? What CGD is about is you can ask those difficult questions that people refuse to ask and actually find solutions. We're thinking about how climate change will impact migration patterns, how that will in turn have impacts on people's health. It's challenging to be able to align budget with ambitious programmatic goals, but it can be done. If you can help to make things a little bit better, that's a good way to spend your time. Good morning. Welcome, everybody, to this Centre for Global Development event on Where Next on Aid Funding of um, UK Refugees. Um, I'm Ian Mitchell. I'm the co-director of CGD's um, Europe programme. And I think I think we've all seen the, the importance of this issue grow, um, not just in the UK, but in a number of other countries as well. We've seen um, a large number of refugees partly generated by uh, the war in Ukraine and many countries have used international development budgets to fund the arrival um, of those refugees and their hosting. Um, I guess in the UK it was it's been particularly acute. Um, nearly 30% of the UK's um, official development assistance budget last year was spent on hosting refugees according to the government and that led to the fourth round of cuts to the UK's bilateral budget in as many years. Um, so I think there are important questions about um, how refugee hosting is financed, um, but also how well that finance is used, both for, for domestic task, taxpayers and for um, and for the aid budget. So um, I'm really pleased that we've got such a distinguished and knowledgeable panel here to discuss these issues today. Um, so let me introduce them. Uh, first off, welcome to um, Carsten Stahl who's the chair of the Development Assistance Committee of the OECD. Um, Carsten has got a very distinguished um, career behind him already. He's, he's chaired a number of UN organizations um, and had a career in international diplomacy um, in Denmark um, before arriving at the OECD. Um, we are also got Tamsin Barton, who's the chief commissioner of the Independent Commission for Aid Impact. Um, ICAI have recently done a, a report on this, which Tamsin will tell us about. And Tamsin also has a wealth of experience uh, in senior roles at the Department for International Development and the European um, Investment Bank. So she understands um, both sides of this, I think. Um, we have Oliver Lodge, um, who's a director at the National Audit Office uh, in the UK, who have also looked into the issue um, of refugees and, and Oliver's um, been at the NAO for, for over 10 years, I think, um, looking for value for money issues and, and has responsibility for the value and impact of, of home office spend. And finally, um, we have Jan Pettersen, uh, who's Managing Director uh, of the uh, Expert Group on Aid Studies in Sweden. Um, his prior positions include Economic Advisor at the Ministry of Finance, and he's been a researcher at Stockholm University where um, he also got his PhD. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, this is also an, an international issue um, that a number of governments are dealing with. So it's great to have Jan here to, to give us that international perspective. Um, so enough from me, Let, let's start to hear from our speakers. And um, let me turn first to you, Carson, if I may. And I mean, perhaps we can start with with just what the, the rules are in relation to counting refugees as um, official development assistance. Um, but it'd be great also if we could come on to, uh, I mean, just the, a fundamental question, I suppose, which is, you know, is hosting refugees consistent with ODA's core aim of supporting development um, in developing countries? Um, and then maybe you can tell us a little bit about some of the best practice you've seen from, from other countries and, and what you'd expect as DAP chair from, from the UK and from others. Thank you very much, Ian, and, and uh, thank you for the invitation to, to join here today. Um, it is, of course, this issue about ODA 
reporting of Indonor Rift Cost is a very important topic to discuss. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be involved in that discussion. Um, let me say, first of all, that there is a well-established basis for the inclusion of Indonor Refugee Cost, as I see it, in ODA reporting, and I'll come back to that. At the same time, and also from the outset, I want to stress that these expenditures were never foreseen to make up a significant part of DAC members' uh, ODA reporting. And in going forward, it's crucial that DAC donors take a cautious approach to the estimation of in-donor refugee costs in their ODA reporting to the OECD. I think that, for me, is, is a key message here. I'll try to first to cover the ground in terms of the rationale for reporting these costs. I'll then discuss the current reporting rules before sketching out some important takeaways from the uh, in respect to on going forward. The ODA DAC rules have allowed DAC members to report in donor refugee costs as ODA since the 1980s. I think we have a records at least I've seen from 1992 onwards that for more than 30 years. Uh, th in that time, it was agreed that the first year cost of a sustaining developing country refugees arriving in donor countries could be reported as, as ODA. The rationale behind it uh, was and is to reflect the financial effort made in hosting refugees and in sharing of responsibility with developing countries who host the vast majority of the world's refugees. So we are in the humanitarian part of ODA in addressing this issue. A few years ago, I was involved in the negotiations on, on the Global uh, Refugee Compact uh, as chair of the UNHCR Executive Committee. And I clearly recalled the discussion in Geneva of global responsibility sharing and humanitarian obligations. The logic is, if a Somalian refugee seeks protection in Kenya, donor assistance to share the cost of supporting him or her is ODA. If a Somalian or Ukrainian refugee seeks protection in the UK or Germany, the same rationale may apply. However, with some safeguards, specific accounting rules for international flows and transparency requirements. So there's a parallel here. Now, if we look into the focus today, which of course is the United Kingdom, here in donor refugee costs started to increase in 2014 with a first peak in 2016 during the European migration refugee crisis, when they represented 3% of NATO ODA. The cost started rising again from 2019 onwards with a steep increase in 2021 when they represented 9% of net ODA and then a further very sharp increase in the preliminary figures for 2022 which you alluded to again to 29% of total net ODA. The increase in 2022 for the UK is as I understand it due to an increase in ODA eligible cost of support for asylum seekers as well as support for Ukraine visa schemes and Afghanistan citizen resettlement schemes. Now, in donor refugee costs are a separate, is a separate item in ODA reporting. And as I said, it was never envisaged to be a major part, major component of ODA from DAC members. We saw the, 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 that changing for the first time when exception numbers of refugees arrived in Europe in 2015, 2016. And the share of in donor refugee costs in ODA reporting rose sharply. That led the OECD DAC, the Urban Assistance Committee, to clarify the reporting rules in 2017, further pinpointing that, first of all, in-donor refugee costs can, can only be defined as ODA for the first 12 months after arrival in the first country of asylum. If a refugee or asylum seeker, uh, after a few months in one country, moves to another country, this does not start a new 12-month cycle for the new donor host country. Second point, that this cost can only be uh, allowed for temporary sustenance expenditures that can be reported as ODA, that is food, shelter, accommodation, primary and secondary school, as well as health costs. Expenditures related to integration into the labor market, expenditures related to vocational training, education beyond the secondary level, skills development, job training cannot be reported as ODA. And thirdly, costs related to rejected asylum seekers, such as detention costs and costs related to forced return cannot be reported as ODA. In terms of best practice in moving forward, the DAC members must be strict on the 12 month rules and they must report only the sustenance costs as defined by the DAC reporting rules. DAC members are encouraged to be conservative. I made that point in, in a recent blog. Whenever they make their assessment, not to risk over-reporting, but always to act on the side of caution. The authority is responsible for ODA reporting in each DAC uh, country, DAC member, 
must also engage substantially with relevant national authorities and colleagues in other DAC countries and with the OECD Secretariat to make sure that DAC reporting rules are strictly applied to and that members take a cautious approach to the estimations. Finally, DAC members need to reflect on how they best cope with potential ups and downs in indonor refugee costs in the future. Even though these costs can be reported as ODA, that doesn't mean that the country has to do so. And if reporting indonor refugee costs as ODA, uh, DAC members still have to have the option to decide that such costs are additional to their planned development budgets. This is, for example, what Austria and Slovakia did in 2022, meaning that these costs did not have a negative effect on already budgeted or planned ODA programs and contributions. It's also possible, as we've seen in some cases, for DAC members to cap these costs at a certain percentage or as a, at, a, at a certain fixed number of their total ODA, ensuring that the only part of reportable costs are covered by ODA budget. That's what the Netherlands did, for instance, for Ukrainian refugees in 2022. The main concern here is that good development cooperation is based on multi-year planning and commitments, whether formalized or assumed, or understood by way of multi-year indicative figures, and that predictability is the key. Stop-go is not good for development, long-haul and stable efforts are. Therefore, it's wise to be flexible in overall aid budget so that in-donor refugee costs and a rise in these costs do not negatively affect other planned or anticipated development activities. To sum up these points, there is, in my view, a well-established basis for the inclusion of in-donor refugee costs in ODA reporting. At the same time, as I said several times now, these expenditures were never foreseen to make up a significant part of DAC members' ODA reporting. Uh, and I hope that the clarification of the reporting rules agreed to in 2017 have helped uh, regulate the reporting of such costs in the following years. But with the Russian aggression against Ukraine and humanitarian crisis this cost caused in Ukraine, it was only to be expected that in-donor refugee costs would increase dramatically in 2022. Let me conclude basically, therefore by saying that if no other major wave of refugees arrived in the UK or Europe this year, it is to be expected that the, the share of in-donor refugee costs in, in ODA reporting will decrease again. It obvi it's obvious that we have to observe these trends very carefully, but my hope is that we will not see a repetition of 2022 this year or hopefully uh, in the in the years to come. I think that is the main point here, and I want to to once again to to thank you for for having me. In. I look forward to the discussion, the questions afterwards. Thank you. Great, thanks, Carsten. It's it's really interesting. I you know in your blog, it was interesting to hear you emphasize the the conservative and, and corporate approach, and I, I think maybe we'll let's come back to that when we heard the experience of, of the UK. So. Um, comes in let me let me turn to you um if i may um you, you've looked at this in great detail and, and and had some some access to information that that maybe not maybe not public to help you reach your conclusions so how did the uk deal with the the budgetary implications of asylum seekers and refugees and um maybe you can also tell us a little bit about the experience of refugees themselves and 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 tell us what the uk can do better from your perspective thanks ian well, to your first question, how did the UK deal with the budgetary implications of refugees? The short answer is not well. Uh, so ICAI, as the foreign aid watchdog, looks at all areas of aid spending. This was a rapid review. We carried it out in six months. And for rapid reviews, we don't score our reviews. But I think I can safely say uh, that this was the poorest in terms of value for money of the reviews, uh, looking across the topics of reviews that we've carried out since the beginning of this commission. So what? how did it not manage it well? Well, first of all, it has to be acknowledged, as Carsten has mentioned, that costs have genuinely soared for the reasons mentioned. There have been many more refugees to look after in the UK as in other countries. So this has been partly uh, arrivals from Ukraine, arrivals still from Afghanistan, uh, but it's also very much to do with people arriving seeking asylum, both in increasing numbers, but this is where it gets to the management from the value for money point of view, and I think we're going to hear more from Oliver about this. The backlog has, has led to a situation combined with the challenges of finding accommodation in the UK 
uh, where each asylum seeker was costing £120 uh, per day individually. And that's a very key element of, of the soaring costs, uh, which, as mentioned, are twice the average in the OECD. So the costs did go up. But what I really want to stress is that it was the UK's choice to charge the full costs. Uh, and as I shall explain, perhaps more than the actual cost, that's difficult to determine. So these soaring costs did lead to huge problems with predictability. There was a quite dramatic session in the International Development Committee when the top civil servant in the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office explained that he didn't know what his budget for aid was uh, because it was so uncertain how much would be charged to it as a result of in-donor refugee costs. This is because of the way that the UK manages its aid uh, target, which means that that is the department which is the saver of last resort. What was the impact of that? Well, it meant that this was the main category of aid. It was counted as humanitarian aid, but humanitarian aid as normally understood, provided in developing countries, decreased dramatically because of this pause uh, which had to take place on all spending from July to November in 2022 because of the soaring costs and unpredictability. So, for example, when the floods happened in Pakistan, uh, these devastating floods, initially uh, there was what was described as a paltry response of 1.5 million from the UK. Eventually it went up to 36 million, but that was much less than other donors and far less than in the past. And again, in relation to the drought in the Horn of Africa in 2022, the UK was very late to respond and less than before. So we consider that the in-donor refugee costs becoming the largest sector of ODA in UK aid represents a significant loss in efficiency and equity compared to aid being provided to people at the original point of need. What is true is the government did respond eventually, and this is a positive in temporarily increasing the spending commitment uh, by 2.5 billion over two years, uh, which makes some difference, but given that the costs were 3.7 billion in 2022, uh, it only somewhat mis mitigates the disruption to UK aid. So the Minister for Development, Andrew Mitchell, told the committee in December 2022 that he was expecting a 30% reduction still across all bilateral ODA for this year. So in our view, this whole system uh, where the, the charges from one department appear on the budget of another undermines incentives for the long-term planning, which will achieve better value for money and reduce costs. And we looked specifically at how the asylum contracts uh, were managed, which is a very big proportion of this spend, and we found that they were managed very poorly. Also, importantly, in relation to the discussion that we just heard from Carsten, we found room for the government to take a more cautious and more conservative approach to reporting. In general, it uses modelling rather than reporting actuals, and that, that is a considerable risk of over-reporting. We saw this perhaps most clearly in relation to the Homes for Ukraine scheme, and I can answer more about that that comes up in questions. So to move to the experience of refugees, at ICAI we always ask people, what was your experience, the people who are expected to benefit from UK aid, to feed into our reports? The biggest problem for them is the backlog because they don't know what's going to happen to them. The other key point to make is there's a big difference as to who you are. If you're a Ukrainian, you're relatively better looked after. Afghans are probably next. And refugees through the traditional UN High Commissioner for Refugee Scheme are no longer coming because they've been crowded out. If you're an asylum seeker, your experience is broadly going to be worse. And there are many differences in different parts of the country, from hotel to hotel. But I should report that we did hear about a lot of lapses in relation to safeguarding in relation to hotel accommodation, particularly for women and girls who face significant risk of gender-based violence and harassment. We found a very important role played by voluntary organisations, usually very under-resourced, um, although there, there was more um, resourced to help uh, than in the past with the asylum contracts. 
we could only visit a few sites and hear from a few people, but we take some reassurance from the work of the Inspector of Borders and Immigration, who was able to look at it much more widely and did broadly find reasonable standards. And we are aware that in some other countries, it may be true that hotel accommodation is very expensive, far from suitable, but at least we're not seeing significant homelessness yet. So very briefly, what can the UK do better? Well, first, we think the government, as we recommended, should consider introducing a cap or a ceiling on the proportion of the aid budget for internal refugees, or alternatively introduce a floor for the SCDO to avoid further damage. The UK should revisit its methodology for reporting in donor refugee costs, as Iceland has done, with the aim of producing a more conservative approach. Thirdly, the Home Office should strengthen its strategic and commercial management of the asylum accommodation and support contracts for greater value for money. Fourthly, the Home Office should consider resourcing activities by community-led organisations and charities as subcontractors in the support contracts to support newly arrived asylum seekers and refugees. Fifthly, the government should ensure that ODA funded refugee support is more informed by humanitarian standards, in particular as regards gender equality and safeguarding principles, which should be integral to all support services. Last but not least, the Home Office should strengthen its learning and be more deliberate, urgent and transparent in how it addresses findings and recommendations from scrutiny reports, because we've seen that they haven't listened to the excellent advice that they've had from the National Audit Office and the Inspector for Borders and Immigration. Thank you. Right, thank you, Tamsin. I mean, you, you've put that very calmly, but there's some, you know, some really damning conclusions from your report there. I mean, to be the worst value that you've seen in, in your role. I, um, I mean, you and I have spoken about this before, but I. I find it incredible that you know, the UK has a, a well-managed system of spending reviews and accounting officer responsibility for public money that, that for some reason, because the aid target is treated as a ceiling, has been completely thrown out the window. And as you said, the permanent secretary for FCDO in the year doesn't know what budget he will have. It's, it, I think it's an incredible set of, um, of circumstances. And um, just to, maybe one question that I, as we get into discussion at the end that I can put on Carsten's agenda is, you know, if we do find that the UK has, well, through its modelling, overstated its refugee costs, what, what, it would be interesting to know what that means from a from a DAC and um, data recording perspective. Um, so perhaps we can we can come on to that in a minute. But it, the other half of what you said, Tamsin, takes us neatly on to um, to Oliver's remarks, um, and you know, it, it's clear that. The government is spending more on this than it needs to and i think the home office has ambitions for reducing those costs so oliver let, let's let's turn to you how is um how is the home office progressing on on reducing those cost pressures um what what does it need to do what more does it need to do to achieve value for money in in, in those expenditures for hosting refugees um and and is there anything cast and emphasized predictability and avoiding ups and downs are there processes in other parts of government that, um, that, that allow departments to deal with these lumpy areas and you know, unexpected um, um, flows of costs? Over to you. Thanks, Ian. Um, well, look, thank you for inviting me here today. And we've heard uh, already from Carsten and Tamsin uh, lots on the rules around in donor refugee costs and the implications and impact of the current situation. What I'll do is focus on how the Home Office is controlling or trying to control an element of those costs, so not the totality. We've done some work looking at the Home Office's spend on asylum support. Um, and to set the scene, uh, in 22-23, the Home Office spent £3.6 billion on supporting people seeking asylum. So that is in the form of uh, payments uh, to help uh, them when they're destitute and also providing accommodation. Not all of that scores as ODA uh, because of some of the rules Carsten mentioned, but clearly it presents a growing and significant proportion uh, of our ODA commitments. Uh, and that 3.6 billion is 2.2 billion pounds more than the Home Office budgeted for that financial year. 
Uh, so a significant uh, growth, more than double the previous year and a lot more than it expected. And it had to be supported uh, by payments uh, from HM Treasury uh, within the year to help it meet uh, those demands. Um, put simply, uh, the reason costs are increasing are, are, are as Tamsin said, that the Home Office is supporting more people for longer uh, and in more expensive accommodation. So the use of hotels is growing. Uh, and to, to set the scene there, um, in March 2023, there were 173,000 people waiting for a decision on their asylum claim. Um, more than 75% of those people had been waiting for longer than six months. And that equivalent figure from back in 2017 was 43% of people had waited for more than six months. So you can see that it's growing, people are waiting longer. Of those 173,000, 109,000 uh, were in accommodation paid for by the Home Office. And 48,000 of them were staying in hotels, which of course, much more expensive than uh, what the Home Office calls dispersal accommodation in the private rented sector. So a significant challenge, uh, and the Home Office is doing a number of things to try and meet this challenge and get on top of it. Uh, so you will all be aware of policy changes uh, in this space, the Nationality and Borders Act, the uh, partnership with Rwanda uh, for third country asylum processing, uh, and the illegal migration bill coming through Parliament at the moment. What we focused on was the operational changes the Home Office is trying to implement. So it's asylum and protection transformation program, which put simply is trying to do two things. Firstly, speed up the processing of claims. Uh, if claims are decided quicker, people are supported for less time. And secondly, find a more cheaper accommodation out in local authorities through those contracts Tamton mentioned so that they can reduce the use of hotels and save money that way. So how are they doing? Um, I'll, I'll start with accommodation. When the Home Office started this program, it had incredibly ambitious aspirations to find an additional 500 beds each week in local authorities. Uh, it quickly scaled back that ambition uh, such that it wanted to find 350 beds a week. Uh, but when we looked in the year to April 2023, it had found on average 48 beds a week. So way off its uh, ambition uh, and part of the reason uh, worryingly was that it was failing to coordinate uh, its different calls upon local authorities so at the same time as trying to find these beds it was trying to find places for accommodation centers uh, and and dealing with other pressures in the asylum system and as local authorities were being contacted variously by different parts of the Home Office that was straining relationships and making it much more difficult for the Home Office to achieve what it wanted to achieve. The picture is slightly better on their efforts to speed up the processing of claims. Uh, so by April 2023, the Home Office was making around 1300 uh, claim decisions each week. Uh, that's about double uh, from July 2022. Uh, and its aim there was to meet the Prime Minister's commitment to clear the backlog of older legacy claims by the end of December this year. Um, our analysis shows that in order to do that, they would need to be making 2,200 claims a week, uh, decisions a week. So there are still a little way off that. Um, but more worryingly, we did have some concerns about the extent to which these improvements in productivity they are making are sustainable. So to get up to 1,300 decisions a week, the Home Office is focused on streamlining processes for claims from high grant countries, countries where claims are more likely uh, to be positively decided. So there are questions about how replicable that will be for the remainder of the backlog. Um, I think there are also questions about the number of uh, what are called administrative decisions uh, that are taking place more recently. So a focus on uh, claims that are either withdrawn or implicitly withdrawn because the person claiming asylum hasn't complied with an element of the process. So can they sustain the level of progress they're making on the backlog? Uh, there's a question there. But I think more important is that even if the Home Office is successful in deciding claims more quickly, and resolving this uh, long-standing backlog of claims in order to bring down the costs um, and therefore bring down uh, the uh, cost that's scoring against ODA, 
uh, it needs to avoid a new backlog building up or avoid it shifting its current backlog one step down in the process. Uh, and our report raised a real risk that actually in speeding through claims very quickly, um, that backlog could shift to the immigration tribunal system. Uh, and that matters because people can continue to uh, claim support uh, and live in accommodation provided by the Home Office until they've exhausted all rights of appeal on their claim. Uh, so unless the Home Office very actively manages uh, the implications of the changes it's making to the wider system, it's not going to successfully manage that cost pressure and it's certainly not going to deliver value for money. I'll stop there. Great, Oliver. It's, I mean, it's, it's fascinating to hear, you know, almost everything the Home Office is trying to do. If you live in the UK and read the newspapers, you know, nearly everything you've mentioned is is featuring in, you know, in, in a high profile way. So, you know, from streamlining the process for some countries, that's hit the headlines. You know, MPs who are in constituency where they're trying to find cheaper accommodation, that's hit the headlines. So, you, you know, I mean, I guess there is a, 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 a tinge of sympathy for the for the Home Office in trying to make you know make this system um work for people and and you know taxpayers and, and asylum seekers alike but it i suppose you've set out the scale of the challenge and uh, one of my takeaways is you know just whilst there's progress it, it doesn't it doesn't feel like it's it, it's in a transformational position at the moment um and so from an aid budget perspective at least it's it's going to be an ongoing pressure um, it seems i think that's so, fair yeah thank you very much um so let's now uh, Zoom back out again and get and get more of an international um, perspective. Um, Jan Pettersson uh, from the Swedish Expert Group for Aid Studies is is with us, and um, you've studied this in from a Swedish perspective, Jan, with a, with a, the reports. And, and there's also been, been some Swedish uh, move, some movement in Swedish policy uh, on this, which I, which I don't think you're claiming, but I, I feel I'm sure you had some influence on. So, um, could you tell us first how how Sweden is dealing with um, the costs of asylum seekers and refugees in terms of aid. Um, how did that connect to your work? Um, and and the, I think I think a cap is one of the, the the proposals that's been considered. So perhaps you can tell us how that's working and and any other any other international perspectives that you're aware of. Thank you very much, Ian, and and maybe in particular a big thanks to. Tamsin and our sister organization, ICAI, for, for a very interesting uh, review. Um, I, I Almost everything I say can be found in the uh, EBA working paper published in December 2022. And I think that uh, Nicole kindly posted uh, a link to it in, in uh, the chat. Uh, and I think uh, it's important to say that we, in that report, do not study any, any effects of uh, services provided in Sweden. Um, I think maybe the greatest similarity between Sweden and the UK is that we've managed to construct a system that is um, pretty well working uh, in sunny days, but is then challenged by volatility and unpredictability of uh, the number of asylum seekers. Um, Sweden has reported in donor refugee costs since the early 90s. And uh, I think in, a, in, in a, the UK experience seems to be one of very low volatility than increasing and almost exploding last year, but, but it's been a bit more volatile in, in, in Sweden. It's been ranging between four to eight uh, percent of the total aid budget that has been deducted for reporting in donor refugee costs. And when I say deducted, I think it's a, it's a difference between what is deducted from the total aid frame, which think of it as the 1% target, and then you deduct a certain percentage for use for in donor refugee costs, and what's reported to the OEC DAC and used for international comparisons. For various reasons, those uh, might differ, and sometimes quite a lot. Um, but still, from these 4 to 8%, from the around 2010, it's gradually increasing before peaking at 22% in 2015 then gradually decreasing to 21, hitting an all-time low of uh, just under 2% of, of the aid, uh, total aid budget. Um, now the 2022 share then ended at around 10.5%. Um, and there you see a difference because in international to OECD DAC, what's reported is a, a share of 6.8%. Uh, 
So 6 billion Swedish crowns were deducted, 3.8 billion Swedish crowns was used and reported as in donor refugee cost, but, but um, the unused funds wasn't transferred back to, to the, um, the rest of the uh, aid budget. And now uh, the budget for this year states a 7.4% uh, percent, percent deducted of, of the total amount uh, budgeted. But I think maybe larger problem than these uh, variations over year are really the within year changes. Um, so, so appropriations in other aid activities than, than in donor refugee costs are affected in the spring and amending budgets. And, and, and Sweden has uh, in almost every of these uh, 30 plus years that uh, in donor refugee cost has been reported uh, changed appropriations at least once within a year and sometimes to 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 quite high, high extent 50 percent of, of of deductions um and the the effects of that if this of course carries a lot of efficiency costs not least in terms of forced renegotiations of contracts uh in bilateral aid within years and sometimes repeatedly so if funds then are transferred back at the end of the year um I think one one interesting uh, effect overall uh, is that we found in this paper was that um, the 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 um, is that the the overall effect has been rather an absence of increase in appropriations in what's not in donor refugee costs than decreases in those appropriations, uh, and this is because the 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 total amount of aid increasing as a result of it being linked to GNI has been larger than the changes in, in donor refugee costs in, in almost every year. Um, so um, let me say a bit about the, the, the cap. So in this year, the, the Swedish government uh, announced a, a cap of 8%. So no more than 8% from the total amount of aid will be deducted. And um, this, um, is essentially a floor on, on Swedish uh, aid that, that is not um, um, in donor refugee costs. Uh, but it might also be a ceiling because there's no announcements or, or, or commitment to, to also transfer back unused funds. Um, and, and looking back, this 8% ceiling, it uh, would historically affected Swedish ODA in uh, eight years out of 31. And it's really uh, an effect of, um, um, it, it, it will really affect Swedish aid only in exceptional years. So it will ha not have any, any effect in normal years. As I said, it has been varied. Uh, it ha hasn't been larger than 8% when there's not been any, any, any large increases in the, the number of asylum seekers. Uh, and of course, this um, ceiling, it hasn't been stress tested yet. So it remains to be seen whether it's uh, actually going to bite when, when it's uh, challenged. But if it holds, it of course will, will uh, protect other aid in exceptional years. Um, maybe just a few words on, on other OECD countries. In the report, we asked seven of our sister organizations two questions, whether the the uh, counting the reporting of in donor cost affects the rest of the oda budget uh, and uh, if they make within year adjustments and four countries denmark the uk netherlands and iceland are reporting uh in donor refugee costs to have an effect on on uh, what's not uh, in donor refugee costs whereas uh, Finland, Ireland, and Germany report is not to have an effect, and they are, of course, the ones reporting it then additionally. Um, three countries also report uh, within-year changes to, to, to be a problem, to, to, to um, uh, af are, are affecting the aid budgets uh, uh, in response to, to changes in refugee forecasts. And, um, of course, those countries most affected are also countries that has, as, as you said, Ian, a, a ceiling uh, of the, the amount of uh, aid. I think I'll stop there. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Jan. I mean, it's, it's interesting to hear from you in the way that the, uh, 
you know the the sort of dedicated funds are working that i mean in one level it limits the cost but at another level the money doesn't seem to be coming back so it's becoming there's a parallel with the uk where the you know the the 0.7 percent and now the 0.5 percent gni were ostensibly minimums but they're being treated like maximums and and that's leading to a lot of uh a lot of the the situations that um that we see today so um thank you so much for that that was very interesting so we're getting some questions coming through let me let me return to the first one that i posed to carsten and which which hopefully he picked up um when when i said it which is that I and mean, if, if it does emerge that that the uk has overstated its its cost of refugees is is that something that the dac would take an interest in do they do, have you been in a situation? Are you aware of a situation where DAC has gone back and revised figures um, retrospectively, or um, adjusted its its historic records? It's not the DAC's responsibility to manage UK policy, but you know the counting that DAC does is obviously quite important, especially with the the prominence of targets in the UK. No, 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 no it's a, it's a, it's a good question, and let me first of all say, of course, that that the OECD is not an adjudicating body, it's not a court of law, uh, and, and we don't have judges sitting there to, to basically sentencing countries to whatever kind of punishment they, 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 we deem to be fit. The way, the way that the OECD works is much more collaborative. What the UK has produced now are preliminary figures. That was basically released uh, by the OECD DAC, by myself in Washington on the 12th of April, and there's now work going on for the next few months that would consolidate those figures. That means that the dialogue between the UK authorities and the DCD secretary, the people that do the statistics at OECD, in order to consolidate to see whether there are any discrepancies, anything that we don't understand. We ask questions, you, can, you answer questions. So there's basically a kind of, uh, uh, as I said, yeah, yeah, uh, firming up of the figures and, and make sure that these are really understood in the right way. Uh, it, it's also very clear that um, what we see is, is basically that process of consult consultation, of consolidation, working uh, normally in the sense that, that if there are things that we need to enlighten, uh, we, we, can, we can have that discussion. It's also very clear that we have encouraged, the OCD has encouraged countries to come forward with their methodology on these issues. And there's, a, to a certain degree, a community of practice between the 32 members of the OECD that, that deals with this, reporting uh, the reporters of the various ministries, uh, and, and to try to, to be sure that we share methodology, that we discuss methodology, that you have a community of practice, so to speak, on, on that, in, 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 in essence at least. And so that there's peer relearning, and, and, and there is a, a kind of professional discussion around these figures. Um, if you have light in the room, if you have that kind of professional discussion between the UK authorities and the OECD, involvement of other uh, professionals around the, the, the community of practice of OECD member states, I think that that's basically the way that we, we look at that. And, and, and hopefully out of that, if there are any concerns, if there are any mysteries, and if there are any things that are not uh, stones that are left on, uh, unturned, we, we hopefully we can do that. Um, but I think that, that uh, for me, of course, we do have a concept of integrity of ODA. It is really important that DAC members, and I'm sure, I'm sure they are all aware of that and keenly engaged in this, wants to respect the integrity of ODA, reporting directives as set out, as the member states themselves have, have adopted, uh, that these reporting directives are, are, are you know, followed and, and implemented by, by member states. So, but. Rather than seeing this kind of a confrontational process, and I, I, as you may be inherent a bit in your question, I see this as a collaborative, a cooperative process that, that hopefully can sort out any kind of misunderstandings as we, as we move over, or any kind of discrepancies in interpretation that's also a legitimate, that these things will, will basically deal up as, as we move forward, and hopefully that we will see that, uh, that result come. And that basically, I've been only DAC chair for the past four months, but but I think that is the way that I see, and I've understood uh, these these processes to work. That the the ethics, the professionals, the, the professionalism, and the rules based system here will eventually prevail. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. And I think sometimes we take for granted. I mean, the, the fact that you know because the the secretariat puts together information in such a clear way, you know, we're able to have this debate very clearly um, about the amount of ODA that is refugee related. It's very prominent in the first press release. 
um, it, it, it's very it, it enables the opportunity to to challenge governments on on their policy, both of counting and and of budget allocation decisions. So, so I, I do agree with that. Now we've we've got some a couple of questions coming through on um, on the treatment of asylum seekers and, and and the rights that they have and whether that might help. So I'm going to post to first to Oliver and then maybe Tamsin can comment. So the first question is. Um, uh, letting asylum seekers work while their application was being processed would reduce the cost burden on government. Is this being taken into account? And have a couple other countries looked at this trade-off? And the second question is, um, is it not best to proceed asylum applications expeditiously um, and reduce the cost of maintaining them during the processing period? So, yeah, Oliver, if you, would you mind kicking us off on this? And Jan, I don't know if you've got anything to say on the international perspective when, after Tamsin. Sure. Uh, thanks, Ian. Well, I think they're both incredibly pertinent questions. Um, I, I should say before wading in that the National Audit Office uh, doesn't comment on the merits of government policy. We look at implementation. But I, I think, you know, the Home Office is responsible for supporting people seeking asylum who are destitute. Uh, if things can be done to lift people out of that position, uh, then the need for support falls away. The rules, as I understand it currently, are that the Home Office has some discretion uh, to allow people to work, but only if uh, they can, they are qualified to work on one of the jobs on the kind of skills shortage list, uh, and also only if they have been waiting for their claim to be processed for more than a year. So that wouldn't, uh, you know, it would obviously allow some cost to be saved, but it wouldn't have an impact on ODA. So I, I think it's a good question, uh, something that government should be considering in the round. Um, on the second question, Absolutely. Uh, I, I think the more e efficient claims can be processed, the better it is, not just from a cost standpoint, but also for everybody involved, uh, you know, the people who are uh, at the centre of this. Um, I've given the stats on where the Home Office is in trying to do this. I think it faces a lot of challenges, not least the workforce. You know, it is, it's had some success in increasing the number of decision makers it has. It's improving its retention rates but they're still its churn of decision makers is still quite high and it takes a long time to fully train decision makers so that they can work independently and and do the job uh, at the best of their ability so it's a it's a significant challenge yeah thank you just to comment on that before i come to you tamsin which is in this 12 month allowing people to work some people to work after 12 months is interesting it kind of that implies to me that the home office has confidence that they I wondered about whether working might mean that people are more difficult to track or that um, in some way there's some risk there, but, they, but after 12 months, it is possible. It is possible. I don't know to what extent uh, that discretion is exercised, uh, how many people are in that position, but it, it certainly is possible within the, the current arrangements. Thank you. Tamsin. Yes, thanks. I'll, I'll just add briefly to what Oliver has said. And we too, well, we, we're not meant to be uh, commenting on government policy on an area like this because that's not really our remit, which is to scrutinise ODA. But we do, um, for example, we did a review looking at youth employment in the Middle East and North Africa, and it was very striking that the UK was at the forefront in the compact for jobs and pressing countries like Jordan and Lebanon to give work permits to refugees there and, and you know we're supporting that um, and yet it does seem that the conditions are restricted for, for working as Oliver just discussed in more detail in our site visits and focus groups we heard how much people did want to work so it, there were people taking up opportunities for voluntary work for example um, and they said you know that was the best part of their day and made them feel work, they had a purpose in life uh, and we did we did see in some cases people who were working. In particular, we met people who'd come from Afghanistan. I presume that they were able to work because they'd been there for more than a year, or perhaps they some of them were under a different scheme which wasn't ODA funded. Uh, you know, one place we went to, there were people who were very sort of high level professionals, but mostly they were taking work like security guards or whatever. Um, and even if that was a considerable step down from their past occupations they were much happier working than not working um, so definitely from a perspective of, of uh, you know people's well-being that you know we can say we heard clearly from them it would be an improvement uh, and clearly if a policy the policy were changed to allow them to work before 12 months then that would have a positive impact 
or less a negative impact on the age budget. Yeah, very interesting. And, and I think if you look at the uh, you know the Ukrainian Ukrainian experience, um, I haven't got the latest figures in front of me, but at least even even in December, at least half of the arrivals from Ukraine were working. Um, and and then if you also wrap in the fact that those many of those people were staying, you know, in in homes for Ukraine schemes where the you know the hotel costs were obviously the, the, the payments made to people hosting refugees were nowhere near the the same level of cost as um, as hotels. It, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it, it gets you much closer to a model that's um, that's affordable and along with the point you've made about sort of the well-being effect of working. Um, yeah, can I just pick up the homes for Ukraine? Because I don't know if anybody has asked about it, but I think it's, you know, the, the department responsible for homes for Ukraine is not the home of it. It's the department for levelling up housing and communities or the local government department. And it passed on funding to the local authorities. That's the department that didn't previously manage ODA and has, you know, very limited experience of it. And that's where you could see really evident issues of potential over-reporting. Uh, you know, all, all of the um, cost charged have the potential for over-reporting because they're based on models and the Home Office doesn't have accurate, certainly not real-time information about who's coming into the country and when they leave to allow actual costs to be charged. And then you get specific estimates in relation to areas like, you know, health, demands based on age and school, et cetera. They're all estimates. In, in relation to local authorities, then there was an estimate of how much would be what we call odable, chargeable to aid. Uh, and clearly, it wasn't practical for local authorities, which had no experience of this issue, to think through what could and couldn't count as aid on, you know, in relation to specific services. So there did seem to us to be an even higher risk of over-reporting. There and I think that has pretty much been acknowledged by the government, because you're seeing that the, the treasury has brought in a lower tariff this year, uh, and it, what that funding is, so it's not going to hotels as you mentioned, or in the whole, or very rarely is it going to accommodation, but it's basically going to local authorities. So it's a very, you know, it's very helpful to them in providing the resources for them to do more um, for refugees, but it's in effect going into their general pot. Yeah, and, and and just to comment on that too, because this is this is at the heart of the issue. I think. I mean, when we when CGD has done work before on um, you know supporting refugees and asylum seekers and made the case for work, I mean, one of the an integration, one of the things has been to make it worthwhile for local authorities to put their hand up to receive um, people that are arriving, and so that makes the case for you know a, a subsidy or more than the cost, if you like. But then when it comes to counting the costs then then the costs aren't necessarily as as much as the local authorities are receiving and it's interesting the treasury have uh, adjusted that amount of money I, I didn't know that so let me um yeah you you wanted to add something on um asylum seekers right to work um we've also had another question come in just for you on um how the eight percent cap um was arrived at and what, what the process was for for settling at that letter, level yeah, thanks. So just briefly on, on the, the right to work. So the norm in, 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 uh, in Sweden for asylum seekers is that you're expected to provide for yourself uh, to the extent uh, possible. So as soon as you're acknowledged to be in the reception systems, uh, a kind of identity card, a non-valid valid identity card uh, allows you to open a bank account and also works as a work permit. And, and uh, and I'm sorry that I do not have any figures on the shares of uh, asylum seekers in the system actually being employed. So I cannot answer that obvious follow-up question. But um, so 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 that's the when it comes to the eight percent, why eight percent? So there's actually no discussion in the budget bill of of, of the eight percent. So so one answer would be that uh, I simply do not know that. Uh, but looking historically. The, the highest share of, of deductions uh, within normal years have been 8%. So, so maybe a, a, a kind of reasonable way to think about it is that this is a, an attempt to try to shelter other ODA from Indonor refugee cost in, in ex during exceptional years. It's also interesting that the only party that was actually arguing ac actively for uh, a cap was the Christian Democrats, and they were arguing for 10% uh, cap. 
So it was really a win for them, uh, ending up at 8%, I think. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Jan. So um, we're, we're coming into the period where we're, we're going to need to make some, some closing remarks. I'm, I'm going to pose one more question to Carsten, if, if I may, and then, and then perhaps I'll go around the panel in the order just to have 30 seconds more on what, on what you would prioritize or what you think perhaps the, the key issue is to, to focus on, recognizing, of course, many of you won't be able to comment on policy, but um, what should be the priority in, in managing this um, is, is, is the general question. But because I just wanted to touch on, you know, you, you've emphasized the, the importance of integrity in, in the ODA statistic, but also perhaps that, you know, counting refugee costs has, has been a long standing position. I mean, do you? Do you detect any? Do you detect any movement from this among members? I mean, it, presumably, you know, if we look at some of the stats we've heard from Jan, I mean, actually, most treasuries and finance departments are not in the mood to to exclude more of these costs. So, is your expectation that members won't seek any fundamental changes to, to how we do refugees? Um, and 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 your final remark on on what you think the priority should should be going forward. Thank, thank you, Ian. I, I, I don't detect among members a very significant in appetite to, to review this issue from the same from the get-go, basically, and start a scratch. We may come back to, you know, changes and, and adapt, uh, adaptations and, 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 and minor adjustments, but, but I don't see that, that, that basically the fundamental changes to the rules coming up. But I think that what, for me, the, the important thing here is that we have to distinguish between Ukraine and other refugees because the Ukrainian situation in 2022 was unique and it was basically having seven, eight million people coming to Europe from another European country. And it, 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 it created a lot of sympathy, a lot of, of movement and, and a, lot, a lot of support and a lot of ingenuity in finding ways to deal with that burden and that issue, that challenge, that responsibility. So I think that that's, that is a unique situation. I'm much more worried or much more concerned about it because the, the normal pressure of other refugees coming to Europe, other asylum seekers coming to Europe, how the trend will be on that. And that's something that we need to keep an eye on. I do hope that the 12 month rule and the, basically the, the understanding that that 12 month rule actually starts when a, a refugee and asylum seeker is crossing the borders into the first country in Europe. I think that's something that has to, when you, if you talk modeling, if you talk assumptions, then you have to take this into account. We would need to, to see how those figures will develop and then we may need to address it. I don't think Ukraine is a good basis for doing that. I do think that the normal, uh, say, migration patterns are, are more interesting in, in, this, in this sense. And there we are still, I think, in early days and to see what are the structural elements that we're dealing with. And some of these structural elements may be of a size that we, that we will need to address it. But, but I think we still, jury is still out on, on that one. And I don't think we have any, it's not in our work program, so to speak, right now, to, to, to take this up in a, in, a, in a more systematic way. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Carsten. Understood. Yeah. And I mean, you're right. The Ukraine situation is unique, um, both because of the acuteness for, for donor countries um, and, and because it's unusual for, for the source country to be European. But I mean, as we were hinting, maybe there's some actually some, some, some lessons for how we might do it, who, um, refugees and asylum seekers more generally, at least in the UK, in terms of uh, how they are housed and their and their rights when they're they're here. So maybe we can look back at that. Tamsin, let me just turn to you for for thirty seconds of closing remarks, if I may. Thanks. Well, I I, I feel a bit like the you know as with Oliver's report that if you come up with a solution in one place, there's always a risk that it ends up being a problem in another place. Uh, but there, you know, the the two big things to look at here are first of all protecting the the main aid budget so that there's uh, a more efficient and equitable way of using it uh, for the people that most need it. So I think the cap is probably the best solution for that, but the system isn't working. And then there's the overall situation for the taxpayer, uh, which is also clearly important. That system does not work well under the pressures that we're seeing. So we certainly hope that Oliver's report is going to help <laughs> uh, the, the Home Office in particular change the way uh, that it's managing refugee flows. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, on, on the first point, you know, Russia invades Ukraine and the consequences, the UK and a bunch of Western countries cut their aid budget, which is, which I always think is, you know, a remarkable impact on, on exactly your first point. Um, let me turn to you, Oliver. Um, great to have NAO focus on this. Any, any final remarks? 
I suppose the one for me Ian, is that um, a, a very short term responsive approach to financial management, which is kind of what we're seeing in some aspects of this is, is never going to be uh, a way to support, you know, value for money and maximizing value for money. So I think there will always be shocks uh, like Ukraine. Uh, what's needed um, in the structures that we have is a better way to uh, absorb and smooth the impact of those shocks rather than just taking reactive uh, measures that then you know destabilize uh, what it is we're trying to achieve. And I, I don't know that I've got the solution to that, but I think that you know, some of the things that have been discussed today are potential solutions and there's, a, there's definitely room for a conversation around them. Very good. Very good. Jan, uh, we come to you. Any final reflections? Just a quick uh, uh, thing on, on system design. I mean, Sweden is uh, most likely about to enter NATO. And with that comes, of course, a discussion of how to report on the 2% of GDP, the new volume target that we, we are about to enter. And, and I mean, it will not be, I mean, exceptional changes in, in other expenditure areas like pensions will most likely not have an effect on the defense budget. And so, so I think that there are similarities and, and, and differences, and, uh, but, uh, but I think that um, it makes sense to, to uh, treat ODA with the same care and, and respect as I think that NATO members are treating their defense budget. Thanks. Yeah, great. Look, let me, all that remains to say is um, thank you very much to, um, to our speakers. Um, CGD will be continuing working on this issue um, and, and trying to find um, the solutions that are gonna work for, for taxpayers, asylum seekers and uh, developing countries alike. So um, stay tuned and um, thanks for joining us today.